Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This morning we'll be speaking about 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 5 but we will be focusing on verses 2 to 3. So before we even get into the word let's look at the context of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now these were the words of Paul to Timothy before his death and this is profound for two reasons. It's Paul's final words to him before he's going to die and it was important for Timothy to know what Paul had to say to him. Now I remember my grandfather's final words to me, stay with the Lord and stay in the Lord. That was in 2016, I was still in my second year of studying theology at Cape Town Baptist Seminary. By the way, if you sense God's calling you to ministry, don't hesitate. The fact that you are wrestling with the call already means that God's finger is on you, otherwise you would not be wrestling with it. Cape Town Baptist Seminary is a great institution for theological training. You get trained by professional, by experienced pastors who are highly qualified in the field of theology. The skill and knowledge they pass on to you is of great value, plus they are all born again. So theology isn't just a field of study, you get trained by born again theologians. And so, and so as much as you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you also grow spiritually and I would strongly recommend that you visit the seminary and begin your spiritual journey to that which the Lord is calling you. But coming back to the point, it was profound because it was Paul's last words to Timothy, but it's also profound because it is what God instilled into Paul's spirit to say to Timothy, thus making it directly from the Lord and since it is recorded in scripture, we know it is God's word. So this letter is profound because it is Paul's last words to Timothy and it is inspired by God. God wanted all of us to know what Paul is about to say to Timothy from his prison cell. And so in essence, Paul is charging Timothy to preach the gospel despite sufferings and despite obstacles that Timothy might face. I read this article on the internet. And the article identifies the following as key themes of 2 Timothy. Suffering is part of the Christian experience. The Christian response to suffering is steady faith by God's power. The gospel is the basis for Christian endurance. The scripture has power to save and to preserve. True believers will continue in faith. Failure to do so proves only... Failure to do so proves one is not truly converted and the last one false teaching is deadly and must be dealt with firmly now our scripture for today is second timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 5 and it reads as follows in the presence of god and christ jesus who will judge the living and the dead in view of his appearing and his kingdom i give you this charge verse 2 preach the word be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Verse 3, for the time will come when people will not, be, will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own ears, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their eyes away from the truth and turn aside to myths, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all duties of discharge all the duties of your ministry. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I pray, Father God, that as a minister, your word that you would speak to preacher and listener alike for your name's sake. Amen. So if we look at that verse, in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. You see, Paul isn't about to give this charge to Timothy on the basis of Paul being an apostle or on the basis of uh, Timothy being a young pastor, but in the presence of God and Jesus who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing, you see, Christ will return again and his kingdom. In other words, when Christ comes, he will come as a judge. Those that are dead in Christ will rise first and those who are still alive will be raptured to meet Christ in the air. What a moment that will be when we see the Lord. 
for the first time. But here's the thing, he is coming to fetch his kingdom, his own, those who are born again, those whose faith is rooted in Christ, not those who say, I get my kerk. Because there's only one church. Those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died and rose again. Those who have put their faith in the Christ Jesus and followed Him. Those that are faithfully serving the Lord in the capacity to which the Lord has called them. Those that are bearing fruit. Those that are loving one another. That is the church, not the building. He's not coming to fetch a building. He's coming to fetch the blood-washed believers in Christ Jesus. But what about those that are not born again? What about those that say they have their own church? What about those who choose worldly pleasures over surrendering their lives to Christ? Well, I hope your church, your church teaches you this. I certainly know that Kensington Baptist Church will be without an excuse because both Pastor Sergio and I have faithfully preached the good news to you. So what will happen to those who choose to reject Jesus? They will perish. They will not be saved. They will be going to hell. They will not be in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. They will hear those words, depart from me because I do not know you. You see, for everything in this life, there is consequences. If you are born again, you will inherit the kingdom of God. If your faith is in Christ, you will be saved from the final judgment in which people will be allowed to either enter into heaven or be sent to hell. If you deny the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you are willingly choosing hell over heaven. We certainly know that God does not desire anyone to go to hell because He loves us so much that He sent His only Son into the world to save sinners. Paul is one of those sinners whom has been saved by the grace of God, and so have I. And on this basis, Paul is about to give this charge to Timothy and says in verse 2, Preach the word. What word? The word of God. You see, Paul constantly is emphasizing this. If you look in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 8, he says, So don't be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. If you look in verse 13, what you heard from me, in other words, the message that Paul has given to Timothy, which is in reference to the gospel, Keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. In 2 second, in second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, And the things you have heard me say, again in reference to the word, in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people, who will also be qualified to teach others. And then lastly, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So, it is clear there is a great emphasis being put on the Word of God. This is not only a charge, but this is also the only solution to the problem of sin. The world needs to hear the Gospel. The Word needs to be preached. The world around us is wicked and lost in sin. The church is the place that must stand out like a sore thumb in the community for the truth it preaches and the truth that it maintains. The church must be, the, must be like a hospital where the world can come and find refuge and meet the physician of the soul, Jesus Christ, who not only heals you, but heals your soul as well, because that is what is important. Now, in this context, Timothy was a young pastor. He was expected to open the Bible and to preach it. And if you look in our, in our communities today, I can actually see the effects of false teaching. It has no effect. But if the word, the gospel is being preached, lives will be changed. More and more people will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I often wonder, so many churches in our communities, yet so much lawlessness. We can't afford to entertain the flimsy preaching of God's word. Further on, Paul writes to Timothy that he must be prepared in season and out of season. Now, these are the words to Timothy, whether he is in an awkward position, whether he is being threatened, there will never be a time not worthy of preaching the gospel. Whether he was in a church gathering, whether which is convenient, or whether he was in a prison cell for preaching the gospel, he had to preach the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes. This charge is also applicable to us. Now I am aware that perhaps not all of you watching this video is a pastor. 
But you as a child of God have the responsibility to be the light and salt of the earth. You too are called to preach the word. You too are called to preach, to share your faith. The power is not in the delivery of the message, but in the message delivered, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, it's so easy to spread gossip. It's so easy to talk about others and to criticize. But why is it that when the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, hardly crosses the lips of believers today? Now, please excuse me if I, if I am exaggerating, but we so easily can talk about everything under the sun. But when it comes to sharing our faith out of season, and then what do we do? But now coming back to the text, further on Paul writes to Timothy, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. In other words, if there's any false teaching among believers, call it out and correct it. If there's any sin in the church, address it and, and rebuke it. Encourage one another. So what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying build one another up in the word of God. You can speak to your friend, you can speak to your parents and that's good. But at the end of the day, let the word of God teach you and may his Holy Spirit lead you in all truth. Yes, we all make mistakes and need to be corrected from time to time. Yes, we all carry ourselves in a worldly manner. For that, we need to be rebuked. I remember one day I lost my temper on someone and I was rebuked for that. The word of God teaches me that I must love the next person as I love myself. I must love my brother and sister the way that I love God. I must love my brother and sister the way I love myself. And that way the love of God is made evident and I prove to be a disciple of the Lord. But if I raise my voice and deliberately disrespect somebody out of anger, which I did, then I am allowing my anger to lead me to sin. And that is sinful. And for that I had to be rebuked. I was behaving unbiblical and there was biblical grounds for me to be rebuked. And believe me, I was rebuked. And it did hurt a bit. And yes, I was embarrassed. But at the end of the day, I grew from that. And the relationship with that person was restored. The condition was, it had to be done with great patience and careful instructions. They come as you can find here with unflee na Jy moet nederig kom na die persoon toe en in liefde na die persoon toe gaan en hulle vermaan. Now look at verse 3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to say. If you look, if you look at around you today, there are so many false teaching going around. The prosperity gospel is one of them, name it and claim it. What does this have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What does this have to do with the cross and how does this address the importance, the important issue of sin and salvation? Many young people are not attracted to sound doctrine. Many young people are not attracted to the sound preaching of God's word. They want to be pampered. They don't want their sin to be addressed. For example, so many young adults don't want to follow Jesus simply because they are sexually active. If they encounter a church that preaches that sex before marriage is wrong, then they lose interest in that church and go to another church where they are promised wealth and prosperity. They say, I'm not ready to surrender my life to Christ. But what they're actually saying is, I acknowledge that I am a sinner, but I don't want to leave my sin behind now. Premarital sex is better than serving God because I get to test drive who I'm going to marry now that is a bunch of rubbish. Let me tell you today, this is contrary to the teaching of God's word. And because God's word teaches us that fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I really feel sad for individuals like that because there's no greater thing than walking uprightly before the Lord. Churches that preach the truth are labeled as judgmental and boring. So the next best thing is to find a church where that is not addressed where the gospel message is watered down, where salvation becomes about speaking in tongues and worship only and not dying to self. Speaking in tongues is a spiritual gift that is operated by the Holy Spirit which indwells the believer. The believer, it cannot be taught. But there are churches that make salvation all about speaking in tongues and receiving material blessings. All those things speak of worldliness, material things and secular things. The word teaches us that if you love the world and the things of the world, then the love for God is not in you. 
but it is appealing to the ear because realistically we want to hear positive things we want to hear that a breakthrough is on its way we want to hear that a promotion is on the way we want to hear that our finances will increase and that all our it and that is all our itching ears want to hear and so we align ourselves to those churches that preach those things and forsake the unadulterated preaching of God's word because it's comfortable not hearing the gospel because the gospel addresses your sin and addresses your relationship with God. It's uncomfortable hearing that whoever looks at the woman with lust in the eyes is guilty of adultery in their heart. But that is God's word for us. But for the sinner, he has no allegiance to God. Therefore, he will not strive to be holy. Preaching holiness today will leave the church empty. Well, that would just show who the real followers of Christ are. And so as I close, remember Paul wanted Timothy to preach the word of God in and out of season. He also told Timothy that the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine and flock to wherever the itching ears lead them to. And this is happening today as I'm preaching to you. What is being preached in churches today is great emphasis being put on the word of God or on other things. Church attendance which stimulates the ek het my kerk gedachte. Also some churches have become an insurance. If you don't pay your monthly premium, they won't bury you. Now I'm not against tithing and giving financially to the Lord. By all means do so. But this must also be matched with proper doctrine. But I... But proper teaching isn't being done around the issue of tithing. People are starting to think that they have paid memberships and that the church and this stimulates that mentality that ek het my kerk gedachte. This also allows people to miss out on the life of the church because they have, because they've got peace of mind. I attend church regularly, I pay my tithes so I cannot be excommunicated from the church and my church will bury me. My bro, if that is what your church is teaching, then I would strongly suggest that you leave that church and attend the church where the unadulterated word of God is being preached, where you will realize that you are a sinner in need of the Lord's grace. So whenever you hear the false teaching coming out of the mouths of others, address it as best as you can by preaching the word to them in love. There's lots of false teaching that will lead them straight to hell and they will be missing out on a genuine relationship with the Lord and salvation if you look at verse 4 and 5 it says they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths and words and words they will rather obey man-made laws such as cleanliness is next to godliness and you have to wear formal clothing to church those are just examples of man-made stuff but look at verse 5 and this is where i would like to end but you keep your head in all situations endure hardship do the work of an evangelist. Now Timothy wasn't an evangelist, he was a pastor, but he also had to do the work of an evangelist as well. In other words, preach the good news about Jesus. This is applicable to us as well. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Another translation might say, fulfill your ministry. In other words, be fruitful to that which the Lord has called you to. Again, Timothy was not an evangelist, he was a pastor, but he was charged to do the work of an evangelist. The same is true for us. Some of us might not be an evangelist, but we are called to do the work of an evangelist, which is to preach the gospel and to fulfill our ministry by exercising our spiritual gift. Amen. May the Holy Spirit be the after preacher of this word. And my prayer is that you will fall into obedience with the Lord. Amen.